One of the things that I, I think about a lot and I think is important as we as we think about progressing in our career and, and wanting to be in the C-suite and lead teams is that we have to be aware that in our organizations, there is a hierarchy. Whether you wanna have a flat organization or not, there's still gonna be a hierarchy and that hierarchy has power embedded in it. And so by the very nature of having someone report to you or having being in charge of X, Y, or Z thing, that automatically places you in a position of power. And I think we all know that like, power can be abused really easily. And I think what mostly happens with leaders is that it happens unintentionally. Welcome to You Belong in the C-Suite podcast. You are ambitious in life and in your career, but something is missing. You want to bring more of your passion to what you do, because let's be honest, you pour a ton into your work and it needs to mean more. I'm your host, Laura Eigel. I'm a mom, wife, PhD, coach, advocate, introvert, and indoor rowing fanatic. I'm passionate about living a life that's in line with my values. We'll give you the actionable tips and tools you need to lead with your values, make a difference, and have career success. The world needs more diversity and authenticity in the top jobs at organizations. Your leadership belongs there. You belong in the C-suite. What gets you up in the morning? What drives your decisions? What do you stand for? No idea, not even sure where to start? I use my values to guide my life and career. It's the basis of how I've built boundaries for myself and stuck to them. Are you ready to dig into what matters to you? Go to thecatchgroup.com to download your free values worksheet. That's thecatchgroup.com to download your free values worksheet to get to your core values and take action on what matters most. Welcome to this week's episode of You Belong in the C-Suite. I'm happy for you to hear my discussion with Katie McLaughlin, founder, chief strategist, and transformation artist at the McLaughlin Method. Katie provides leadership and culture transformation for mature startups, helping leaders create inclusive cultures, build emotional intelligence, work through their assumptions and biases so that they can actually connect with and get the most out of their teams. She does this through interactive, experiential, theater-based exercises. Her bias for action is high, so attendees to her sessions always leave with at least one action item to immediately do to shift something in their behavior, relationships, and company. Working with Katie, you benefit from the powerhouse combo of her theater background in over 15 years in the heart of business strategy, organizational development, and change management. We had a rich discussion talking about how to be intentional to build thriving workplace cultures, how she incorporates her theater background into her corporate work, mistakes leaders are making and missing out on to build an engaging culture, and how to use your employee survey to create an action plan. I can't wait for you to hear this discussion. Let's get started. Well, I am really excited to welcome you to You Belong in the C-Suite podcast. I'm so excited to have Katie here talking to us today. Katie, thank you and welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited for our conversation. Yeah. Well, if you can please just kick us off by telling us your story. Yeah. So uh, I like to describe my kind of career and trajectory as a bit non-traditional as a, a theater major in college. You know, I graduated where there was a potential obvious career path of, you know, move to New York, try to make it on Broadway, but I knew that wasn't a good fit for me. And so I kind of meandered a little bit from you know, from there, I went to, I went and did a year of volunteer service and did some project management for uh, big brothers, big sisters and you know, client management. Then I went and worked at a, like a school district, administrative unit, managing projects there and kind of accidentally fell into the world of startups and tech. And at a point where I was like, I'm kind of desperate for a job and I really don't love customer service, but I'm really good at it. And, you know, it was a really great gateway that tends to be, um, a good hiring like inroad for a lot of startups would be their customer facing positions. And so, you know, I just fell really naturally into the way that they work in terms of how quick things are moving. It was always interesting and exciting. And by nature, I got, like fell into my 
natural groove of coaching and teaching others without that being officially my role. And I feel like I've just approached my career. Uh, I since then have basically spent almost my entire rest of my career in this tech and startup space. Uh, so for over a decade now, and I feel like that's really my, my happy place is that space where we're trying to create something new and we are really thinking about how do we create a culture that is different, new, uh, supportive of different folks. But I've also been on the other side of that too and seen how it's gone kind of other ways. So uh, most of my career has been in the startup world in like learning and development roles, people facing roles, and uh, working with a lot of customer facing teams. I love it. And I love the beginning of your career. And how does theater kind of show up in what you're doing now? And how do you incorporate it as you work with leaders and organizations? I think that's like so fascinating. Yeah, I, I definitely think that's my secret sauce from, you know, my theater background. Part of what I did was, you know, do some traditional actor training. And just because of that training, you have to really learn how people are motivated, how they interact and how to express that right? How, how to express it and see it. And so from that, I was able to use those skills just in the workplace as a, as a leader, as a manager, you know, as a peer, really learning how to apply empathy and see the perspective of others. I feel like that's a big thing that theater helped me to do. But I also learned a body of theater techniques uh, called image theater that are used to help express some of the, like, the stuff that is just hard to put words to. And a lot of that is like the emotions and like the reactions that we have to different situations. And, you know, this work is, is used in a variety of applications. I didn't invent it, but I'm using it in a very applied way in the workplace and with my, with my clients to be able to really get at that emotional space, the, the things that are behind what people are saying and what we're saying or thinking and get really clear on, well, how big is this emotion, right? Am I really triggered by this thing or am I really excited? And getting clear on what I'm actually feeling helps me to know, do I want to take action that is in alignment with that emotion or do I want to take a minute get myself re-centered so that way I can make an intentional choice in how I interact with this person, my team, whoever it happens to be. I love that. And I think that's just so important as, you know, the world is ever changing. There's so many stressors right now. It feels like a lot of the leaders that I've been talking to, just everything is changing so rapidly. It's been hard to keep up and how they react is just so important. Um, and the decisions that they make to then impact their teams, right? Yeah. Well, and especially now we don't have as many times to interface with our teams. And so every interaction counts and maybe it counts in ways we're not expecting it to, or don't want it to. Right. So I often use the example with some of my clients of, you know, if you're leading a team and when you're in the office and you come out of a meeting that was just really frustrating and you complain a little bit, but then like over time, they get to see you laughing and connecting and, you know, be in your normal self. So they realize that that was a moment in time that you were upset, frustrated, had, you know, really high intensity. Whereas now, if you were to send a, an instant message, whether you, whatever platform you use at work that to just kind of complain or like, Oh God, can you believe that? You know, kind of thing that could be taken at a much higher intensity level. And then the person might start to internalize that as, you know, their, this is how this person sees everybody and not just like, not just the person they're complaining about to me. Yeah. And it's so interesting how that can then inform their perceptions of you and the culture that you create as a leader. Yeah, absolutely. I think that one of the other big things that I bring from my theater background is, is teaching some of that almost actor scene study stuff about how to start thinking about who am I and what do I want? And also who are my people and what do they want? Mm -hmm. Right. So in everything that we do, we ultimately have some kind of goal or intention or key motivator that we are striving for. And that informs all of the different ways that we go about trying to get that thing. And the ways that we go about that uh, are what we call tactics. And if you know that you are intentionally using, using tactics that are motivated by what you're motivated by or looking for to try to get somebody else to do something, 
then you can start to have a conscious choice about the tactics you are using. And the more you know what the other person on the other side is motivated by, that also helps inform the types of tactics that you use. So it can be, you can get to a resolution faster, you can get to agreement faster, and you can get to connection faster, really. Yeah, I love that. Um, so in um, your intro, you described the work that you do to build cultures, especially in startup. So I've not worked at a startup before, but you hear the stories like, you know, they want to keep the culture they started with and they want to, they don't want it to change. And, but inevitably high growth, you absolutely can, some can keep the culture and some cultures completely implode. So as you talk about culture, can we back up first and just define like, how do you define culture and how is that different in a startup? Yeah. So I tend to think that most people just define culture as like a series of events, perks, environmental changes uh, like to a physical office. But in fact, our experience of culture is really in the in-between moments. Uh, so that's in the everyday interactions that you have with your team members. You experience culture in the observation of behaviors that are allowed or accepted when we see leaders making inappropriate comments or we see leaders cheating or like, you know, going outside of their value system and we don't see the repercussions or, you know, the ways that they have to be reprimanded for that. We just still keep seeing them in power. So that is one observation of, well, that kind of behavior is accepted here. Mm -hmm. And that, that then trickles down and kind of like leaks into other areas of your culture that you probably never even thought about before. So that might then spurn, you know, that person's employees to, to emulate that behavior, because if they've gotten where they are and they still have that behavior, then that means maybe I need to be more like them in order to, to get ahead or get, go further. So it's all those little in-between moments of when we interact with anybody at work. It doesn't matter if it's our leaders, if it's a peer, um, someone cross-functionally, all of that counts. Yeah. And I love how you said it's the in-between moments that in intentional or not, right? Absolutely. And sometimes it's the not that's building the culture the most. Right. Yeah. Well, and in the startup world, it typically one of the things that's exciting about startups is the, is the fast paced uh, environment. And many startups will, will describe their cultures as transparent and as like a family, mm -hmm. but I don't know about you, but I think there's a lot of dysfunctional families out there, right? We bring a lot of baggage from our familial relationships. And there's also sometimes this expectation that because you're a family, that you don't have to be on your best behavior, right? Mm -hmm. Or that you uh, might be able to get away with certain things like, you know, being passive aggressive or overly aggressive. I found that a lot of instances where people think that they're expressing transparency are actually moments of aggression, uh, you know, blatantly calling people out for behaviors that they didn't like goals they didn't meet or promises they didn't make um, and doing that in a group that feels very unsafe. And what I've found is that a lot of these elements of, of startup cultures tend to actually breed a lot of bad behaviors. And so that's where we start to see higher turnover and just that crumbling, that breakdown of the culture, like you were describing, especially with that high growth, because with high growth in a startup world usually also means high homegrown management. And I worked in startups for over a decade. I was in charge of learning and development in a lot of these instances. And I never got to build the manager training that was always put on the back burner because new hires always came first and new products always came first. But at the end of the day, those cultures were really hurting because of bad behavior from leaders. Yeah, absolutely. I think in a conversation we had before um, we were talking about, you know, people come to the company for the culture, right? But they leave because their manager's horrible. Yeah, exactly. And their manager can be their most trusted advisor, mm -hmm. but that can also be their biggest adversary. And, you know, one of the things that I, I think about a lot, and I think is important as we, as we think about progressing in our career and, and wanting to be in the C-suite and lead teams 
is that we have to be aware that in our organizations, there is a hierarchy. Whether you wanna have a flat organization or not, there's still gonna be a hierarchy and that hierarchy has power embedded in it. And so by the very nature of having someone report to you or having being in charge of X, Y, or Z thing, that automatically places you in a position of power. And I think we all know that like power can be abused really easily. And I think what mostly happens with leaders is that it happens unintentionally. I really believe that leaders have people's interests more in their minds than, than it might be perceived, but their execution is where they fall down. Yeah. It's interesting to, um, just, if you think about, like you said, like where you spend your most, the most time, especially if it's a smaller company, the culture that your manager creates or that next level up leader creates is sometimes that culture is sometimes more, it, it absolutely impacts you more. Right. And it could be similar to the organizations or it could be very divergent and that is good, or it could be good or bad. Absolutely. I definitely had one manager who I just felt so in sync with. I felt like he respected me and I felt like whenever we would have like our one-on-ones or our conversations that he was super present and that he helped me to become a better person and leader through every conversation that we had, because I felt so uh, respected and, um, you know, included as part of my own development, the development of our organization. And I remember actually that I had said to some colleagues that like, I stay because I love working for him. And he then left and I didn't expect it. I thought he was a lifer. Uh, and so he then left and, you know, that's really where I started to see things and my experience of working at that company really erode and degrade. Yeah. Because of that culture that he had. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it, it's interesting to think how a lot of leaders intentionally do build those moments, but like you said before, a lot don't. So can we talk about what tactics leaders can use to create their cultures intentionally? Absolutely. So one of the biggest uh, changes that I recommend people look at is the amount of time they're spending with their team. Most of us don't spend nearly enough. And I say us, because I know that this is my challenge too. You know, when I'm managing people uh, and when you're in a management role, the, the level of stress goes up, right. And you now have all these people that you have to be responsible for in some way or another, right. Whether that's, um, you know, just being there to be an advocate for them or what have you. So spend more time with your team and carve that out intentionally. I know that that is hard now with many of us working remotely, but I have found that when I have the chance to interact with folks, if I give them an opportunity to join me in like an office hours where they could say, Hey, I need, I need help here. Or they can just pop into a pop into a video call that allows for them to have that, that moment of it. I don't feel like I have to prepare for this. I can just kind of show up and interface with my leader. Uh, when I managed a remote team a, a while back before the pandemic, and that was kind of more what we were all doing. I found that by us doing like even a, a virtual standup where, you know, we would at the beginning of our day, we'd send a message to our shared channel and say, here's what I'm working on. Here's where I could use help. Here's where I'm blocked. And then at the end of the day, we could say, okay, here's what I, here's, here's what I'm celebrating for today. Here's, you know, what my challenges are. And especially because we were on different time zones, they could then say, here are the things I need you to look on before I come back in tomorrow. So, you know, finding those ways that you can stay connected with your team is one big place because the more time you spend with your team, the more likely you are to create some of those intentional moments. I could not love that answer more. <laughs> I mean, and it's so simple, but it's so hard to execute sometimes. Right. And sometimes, like you said, like this idea of like your team is family. And sometimes you're like, oh, I have committed time with my family. And then something else comes on the calendar and you're like, oh, well, they won't mind if I push that. And I see so many leaders that have, you know, regular one-on-ones I'm using like air quotes, right. Cause they're regular, except they're not because they always cancel their one-on-ones because they're like, oh, well, we'll just catch up at another time. And that is like the time that the direct report is just like 
really waiting to get that airtime with them just to get seen, to feel connected, to get you to answer their email that they reminded you about a couple of times. And they need that. And um, I see so many leaders, you know, push those off and it's just so simple, but it's hard to execute. Like you said, because they're so busy. And I think the other thing to keep in mind here is that you know, as I was hearing you describe that, you know, it was very focused on the fact that, you know, the person who's your direct report is, is really seeking that time. And they are also circle back to my idea about power dynamics. Mm -hmm. Your direct report is in a lower position of power than you are as a perception, right? It, it's not, I'm not saying that you are like overtly, like exerting a lot of power over that person, but it's this like implied thing happening in the background. So because of that, they don't want to bother you. And so you have to keep that in mind that because we're in those positions of power, that we have to be aware of that and do what we can to make it safe for our teams to be able to you know, step up and say, hey, I need time with you or this, that, or the other thing. The other piece I'll mention about that kind of other side of like canceling uh, meetings on your direct reports I would encourage all leaders, if you find yourself doing that, or even canceling team meetings on a regular basis, to take a moment of reflection and ask yourself if there's something deeper going on for you. Managing people is vulnerable and can feel uncomfortable sometimes. And if that's the place that you are at with leading people, then the more that you cancel that, the more you separate yourself from it, the more you're actually heightening that, that fear response of yours and making it feel like, oh, this is that going to be that much harder because I haven't talked to this person in three weeks. Mm -hmm. What do I, what do I talk to them about? None of us like to feel uncomfortable or um, socially awkward, but we all have that, that instinct sometimes. Yeah. The other thing that I find that leaders, um, if they're canceling or just don't meet with their teams often, sometimes it's an, it's an interesting a mindset. And they think that if they're bringing their team together, then it's less time for that team to be working on the business or to be connecting with each other. And that the time together might be a waste of time. Um, and I would, I would push back on that. And I would say how, well, how first, how are you using the time? It might be a waste of time. Are you just reiterating like something that they already know about? Like, how are you using that time? Is it quality time? Because I completely agree with you. It's like these intentional moments. How can you build a culture intentionally? It is absolutely spending time with your team. And if it has to be virtual, that's fine. But how are you bringing them in? How are you updating them? How are you creating dialogue? What topics are you talking about? Are you just going down your to-do list? Or are you listening? And that time that you spend together will reap benefits because those are the times to build your culture. Yeah, absolutely. And I think as leaders, we might also think sometimes that it's our job to like always have a teaching moment or always be the expert. And that's also an Achilles heel that we have mm -hmm. to be aware of. We can offer that expertise, but it's even better if we trust our team and we allow them the opportunities to shine, right? Everyone is thirsty for those opportunities. I believe that everyone wants to actually use their skills, feel valued, right? This is that concept of belonging within the workplace. And so if we're not giving people those opportunities to, you know, this is really even small stuff, right? Everybody's working on different things. You're having that team meeting. The intentional action is, you know, Hey, person who's been working on this cool project that you've been only telling me about, I want you to tell the team about it. And okay. I don't want you to think that this is, has to be a huge thing you have to prepare for, but I want, you know, I want to celebrate you and the great work you've been doing. And I think, you know, you sharing that back instead of me sharing that back is really important. I love that. It, it, that, and that's a better idea of transparency, right? It's, you know, exactly. look at this great work. It's also recognition. Um, and then there's probably connections that are made there because they, if it's like any other team, right, they're probably not always talking to each other. They don't know everything going on or they don't know it to the level of detail. And so you're also making connections within the team as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Cause those power dynamics that I was talking about before and those moments of culture happen without you being there, right? Mm -hmm. They happen between peers and, and sometimes 
there's, you know, one peer on the team that is kind of really aggressive compared to other folks and maybe is, maybe is, has been there for longer. And so also has that kind of power of having the most tenure or the background. So just be aware of the fact that there are potentially a lot of different dynamics at play in the way that your individual team members experience working for you, working on your team and working at your company. Yeah. I love those things to think through in your consulting. I want to ask you next, what mistakes besides like not doing things, like what mistakes do you see leaders make as they are building their culture? Yeah. So, um, I would just reiterate that like not doing certain things, right. You know, the not meeting with your team. Um, but I think some of the other mistakes are, you know, not leveraging data that exists out there. If you are um, a leader at a company that has an HR team or a talent team, I would strongly encourage that you talk with them about what kinds of data they have, because one of the biggest pieces of data that I think goes unused the most, and it can be so actionable is the engagement survey or your culture survey, same survey, just different name. And in that, that is ripe with people's opinions about what it is like to work there. And that data is anonymous, but it can also be spliced and diced based off of like your team or your department. So if you're, you know, if you're an executive, you could look at your entire, you know, your entire department and then also look by team by team and see if you see trends. So sometimes what you could do would be to see that there's this data of, Hey, there's a lot of engagement across most of my department, which is great. But then you know, this one team seems to have a much lower score. Like uh, that's an area where I can now go and do some intentional discovery. Maybe I want to go and uh, ask some questions of the leader or try to observe a few things. You know, you don't have to have the, the exact playbook, but knowing where to start looking is really important. That's probably the biggest one I'd see mistakes that leaders make. And then the other one would be the assumption that, checking the boxes of having a team meeting, having a one-on-one, having a team outing on a certain cadence, uh, assuming that those types of what I call check the box activities, that that's enough, right? That that's not the only way that culture is experienced like we've talked about earlier. So that's one of the mistakes that you can make is thinking, oh, I'm doing all these things. So that means I have a good culture. I love the idea of um, engagement survey. So I used to, <laughs> at a big company, I used to manage the engagement survey. So I have seen, oh my goodness, so many leaders surveys and the ones that you know are good. Guess what? <laughs> they have really great engagement scores. People want to work on those teams and the data always show that like they always, and it's rich with insights. So I completely agree that if you're not mining that data. If you're at a company that's big enough that you get a report like that to do that. And then if you're a leader in a company that has multiple teams to break it out, like look at the departments, like you absolutely have to, because you can pinpoint, okay, who's doing what I remember in one organization, you know, it was very clear, like, you know, this manager was doing, you know, all these things for their team. And this other manager had a different approach of not, not spending as much time with their team and guess what showed up on the engagement survey. Right. Right. Yeah. There's frequently questions that are very clearly about your leader and, you know, something, something, something similar, like, you know, my manager keeps me informed about what is happening at my company or, you know, my manager genuinely cares about my well being. You know, those types of questions are on your engagement survey. And so you can see directly uh, what your team thinks. So, not doing something with that or not action planning against it is one of those big mistakes that you're mentioning. Absolutely. Yeah. So, do you have an example? And we've kind of worked on a little, a couple of examples here and there. Any examples of leaders um, that are doing it well? Like, what does action planning, one of those surveys, really look like? Who's doing it well? How do you know, like all those kinds of things? So I would say that the leaders that are doing it well are the ones that are aware that it's even happening, right? That, 
you are engaging with your HR talent team to get that data, you're having conversations with your team, with other leaders to find out how are we actually doing from a culture perspective. And leaders that do it well are also very aware that culture has a direct impact on business outcomes. And so the way that, that those two connect is about productivity, happier people work harder, uh, and also don't have to work as hard or as long to achieve results. Happier people stay longer. It costs so much money to replace workers. And so the more that we can retain those team members, the better that the business does overall, right? So rethinking and reprioritizing people is probably the best strategy that a leader can provide in order to ensure the success of their business. So I am really excited because you have a, you have a tool and I want you to tell us a little bit about it. Um, can you describe it to me? Yeah. So because I am so passionate about the use of this key data point of the culture survey, I have created a guide on how you can use that to show your team that you are listening. So it's a guide on how to optimize your response to that culture survey. So what do you do now that you have this information? And I've got some real world examples in there about specifically on the kind of DEI side that like there are ways that you can achieve results in that realm that could be more surface level results and then others that you could kind of go deeper and create these in-between moments uh, that really improve the culture overall beyond just those kind of target groups that you might be trying to target. I love that. Oh my goodness. I love an action planning tool, <laughs> speaking directly to my heart right now. <laughs> so we will put the link to that in our show notes. Um, so please make sure and check that out on how to ensure that you are listening to your team. I think it's just so important because like you said before, like you can ask, but if you don't do anything about it, that's probably worse than even asking. Definitely. Yeah. And you have the tools, right? And if you genuinely care, which I believe everybody listening to this probably does, you know, this is just one way that you can up-level your ability to show that you're listening. I love it. And to create those intentional moments to build the culture that you want. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, Katie, thank you so much for joining us today. It was such a pleasure. And I loved talking with you about culture and leaders responsibility to build it. Um, I feel like we could have kept talking about this topic for a lot longer too, but thanks so much for our discussion today. Yeah. Thank you. This was great. I want to thank you so much for listening to the, you belong in the C-suite podcast. If you are enjoying this content, please remember to rate and review on Apple podcasts by leaving a review. You are helping others find this content. We will be featuring five-star reviews on air in upcoming episodes. Editing and support for the podcast is done by S and E podcast management to get more tips and tools to help you live a life guided by your values. Go to thecatchgroup.com. Keep your boundaries and take care.